One minute time. I'm Brad. I'm Dave. And today we're here to end out the week with Minute 88 of Lost World. Dave, we've been spending some money on some Jurassic Park pro- uh, Lost World items. Yes, we have. Yes, we have. Um, I got I got myself the complete dinosaur scrapbook from the Lost World. It's great. A bunch of great little tidbits in it from um, the movie. It has screen caps from both Jurassic Park and the Lost World in it. And a lot of them are like original production uh, images as well, not just the screen caps. They sans the filters that would uh, later uh, hallmark them in the movie. Yeah, yeah, because um, looking at the production, this was released in May 1997, so it was out before or right on when the film came out. So they wouldn't have had all the up-to-date details, like there's some parts in here and even some of the photos, the production photos that um, we never seen, RJ in the long grass He's deaf. He's pretty much his deaf scene. The only thing we got close to that. There's a production photo as well that they reused for the uh, the tops cards that I'll talk about in a minute, which is the uh, operations building with Sarah and Nick, uh, Sarah and Malcolm, sort of before he bangs the stick to get the raptor's attention. Mm-hmm. Taken from a completely different angle that's not even seen in the movie. Um, yeah, actually, I think that is seen in the movie. It looks like it's um, a reversed shot. Oh, okay. Like they just flipped the image. Yep. Again, that would be another one. I'll have to. Uh, <laughs> I'll have to check the HD screen cap site. I yeah, I completely misread the cover. I uh, I seen the Lost World logo and complete dinosaur scrapbook and thought Beauty to the Lost World because on the front of it, um, apart from mm-hmm. some concept art of the Trenosaur chasing Alan and Tim, and the Trenosaur blowing Alan's hat off at the breakout scene, all the other photos are. Oh, and there's a Dilophosaur there as well. <laughs> All the other photos from The Lost World, and when I read it, it's a guide to Jurassic Park and The Lost World. Because um, I opened, and 50%, or more than 50% of it's Jurassic Park-related items, where, of course, because that's the film that was out, they could use stills from the movie and everything else to uh, to fill the book out nicely and just dot through some Lost World stuff that they had from production. But we've got a real great The Five Deaths, the Cinco Mortes map as well in here. Yeah, of course I scanned that out. You know, there was something I had to scan out right away. Yeah, the colour version of what we got from um, the inside the trailers, so... Yeah, it is. What else is in here? But see, and oh, even yeah. some of the stills, like, there's a great one here of um, Ian standing in the creek bed with all the sleeping hunters around him. Um, mm-hmm. Just as sort of the T-Rex appears on, on the scene. And actually one of the first images we get here is a shot of a bunch of the hunters um, carrying equipment trekking across the island. You can see Ajay and Roland ahead of the pack with uh, Sarah and Nick at the very end of it. And it looks like uh, one of the guys carrying a long uh, box that looks like it might be housing the um, tranquilizer gun. What page is that? <laughs> uh, it's the very first one right at... It's the very first spread we get... Um, Oh, sorry. Yes, yes. Oh, with yeah. with Doctor Grant, oh, Alan Grant's quotes from the um, from Jurassic Park around the dining table. But yeah, yeah, it's just it's and it's in a on an angle that we don't see in the film again with that beautiful mountain backdrop and the mist of um, mm-hmm. them tracking along. As you said, we've got one guy in the middle. It's got that long case, another another fairly large case being carried by a couple of hunters at the front that we don't see mm-hmm. the contents of, but. Um, but yeah, there's that that sort of production art there. The Mombasa fight scene as well. Mm-hmm. A couple of pages in. Um, and another one of um, Eddie Park in the trailers. Again, just sort of pre-production photos like that that they released that never were sort of filmed. Well, the, uh, they'll film, but never in the actual movie itself. Um, yeah, speaking of um, deleted scenes as well, on the first page that we get uh, that discusses Site B, Isla Sorna, we get a couple shots of, like, for example, the rap- we get the shot of the raptor sticking its head out of the long grass with blood around its jaws. Yeah. And then and then across from that, uh, just above the shot of Sarah petting the Stegosaurus, we get the deleted scene shot of Alan Grant finding the raptor claw that he then carries around most of the movie. Yeah, and that's sort of that goes back to Jurassic Park as well. Um, that shot was used on the Tops collector cards as well, and it was just another mm-hmm. pre-production shot for marketing. But um, 
we never actually seen that scene. Because I think they might have possibly um, re- oh, like revealed more or um, talked more about their relationship because there was there was some scenes or was some stuff from the script were actually talking about marriage at that point too, wasn't there? Um, I believe so. Yeah, there was a couple of deleted kind of tidbits around the uh, the dig site scene that yeah. they cut out just to kind of get us quick to, to the island a little quicker to kind of move things along a bit better. Yeah, because their relationship was sort of played down a lot more in the film, but um, yeah, it was. And and again here too, like just flipping through, you got sort of Nick and Sarah when they're sabotaging the uh, the hunters' camp. Um, there's that one of Nick uh, kneeling down beside the motorcycle that we've seen for a while, mm-hmm. but there's another one there of Sarah sort of leaning down beside a Unimog as well, mm-hmm. um, which I don't recall seeing. Because there's one here of uh, Burke when they're doing the interview, uh, the lecture. Mm-hmm. Um, well, one thing I do like is that um, they have a lot of good shots of concept art in this movie. Mm-hmm. I mean, in this, you know? Yep. It's interesting here too that um, where you get to sort of the discussing the human characters, the uh, the photo for RJ is right when he's making that decision whether or not to go into the long grass. <laughs> so mm-hmm. not not his high point. And like there's a shot here too of um, oh yeah, it is Dita with a a mug while they're watching the um, Ludlow's investor speech, and sort of Burke's there holding his hat, and Dita's got something in that mug which I don't think's coffee. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a fantastic little thing. It's it's from Scholastic, and it was uh, it was seven dollars ninety nine US when it came out. But um, actually, yeah, it's from Mum's house. The price sticker on it from Toys R Us. Oh really? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, in the back corner. What a pay! I paid fifteen dollars for it, so it was a good little a good little thing to get. I actually uh, paid about five for mine, and the shipping was free. Okay. Yeah, well, that sort of works out the same by the time you do the conversion. Yeah, um, I suppose. Yeah. So then the uh, the other thing I got was the uh, I finally I finally found a complete set of the Lost World Tops trading cards on eBay. Um, really? Of course, being eBay, I paid uh, about thirty five to forty of your dollars on them, which mm-hmm. just it amazes me that after the uh, after the the, the after the success of Jurassic Park, we know they almost doubled the toy line and everything else, yet some of this sort of uh, other marketing is just not that widely available. Like, I rarely see full sets of these go up. I've got saved searches for a lot of stuff from both films, and you get you get the, the Jurassic Park ones, like even just single packets, um, boxes, mm-hmm. boxes with... 50 packets in and stuff like that, or even just whole sets, but never, or very rarely, do you see the Lost World ones. But then it's also, again, sort of some of those production stuff. you got here um, Hammond's Dream Revisited, where you got Ian and Hammond sort of either side of that computer with the animal territories on the screen. With, um, it's just like a production shot they took when they weren't even filming. They're both sort of smiling and laughing at each other, saying, here we go again. Um mm-hmm. And then you've got sort of five or six with the stegosaurs and a couple with the hunters. And again, like, it's a, it's a, um, a set of 77 cards, yet only 36 of them are shots from the movie. All the others are those <laughs> um, psychedelic <laughs> dinosaurs with weird fluoro colours and uh, all, all the plethora of artwork that's sort of come out with them as well. But um, there's a nice shot here of the hunters camp in flames. We actually see vehicles on fire, which... Mm-hmm. You don't really get that in the film either. And it sort of, it goes scene by scene. You've got a couple inside the trailer, then there's nothing until um, joining forces where they go back. Then there's nothing until Dita's demise where there's only one one uh, card of that with him sort of looking at the compi after it scares him. Field of Nightmares, you got two shots of that animatronic raptor with its head above the grass, one looking towards the camera and one looking off to the left. And then the the biggest travesty, <laughs> when they finally get to the worker village, you got one of the Jurassic Park gates, which I laminated that card when I originally had it and carried it around for me in my wallet everywhere, just <laughs> with those gates. And then you've got one of, um, as I said before, with that raptor in front of the operations building where Nick and uh, Ian and Sarah are sort of beating a stick trying to get its attention. 
Mm-hmm. And then you've got five cards of Sarah progressing through to Kiln House and evading that raptor, and then just a shot of them in the helicopter um, leaving the island when they open the door and look down at the Tyrannosaur. And then the final card for the movie is that shot of Sarah with the helicopter coming overhead as she's about to tranquilize the Tyrannosaur in the boat. So there's no there's no cards for the San Diego scene whatsoever, which might reflect on their uh, their thoughts of it. Or they might not have even known how the movie ended at that point too. But... Yeah, that's, that's what I that's what I'm possibly thinking is that they were given these the instructions to make these cards before Spielberg actually made the switch to the San Diego scene. Yeah, because there's a great card here too. Like some of these other other cards aren't the actual movie cards there's one here behind the scenes um, where they actually got a crane putting the raptor in the long grass mm-hmm. yeah that one's in the making of yeah yep some stuff the stegosaur sculpting some concept art oh that concept art of the uh, operations building on the lagoon but yeah just <laughs> 77 minus 36 cards of just holographic <laughs> holographic dinosaurs um, the baby <laughs> I love here they got the baby stegosaur with um, the text on there, the world is mine. <laughs> oh, they just, I don't know what they've done. Trenosaur, love to eat you. Dino carnage, or dino damage for the raptors. Hunger for humans for the Trenosaur. <laughs> um, just wanted to get some of this, some of this stuff for, uh, for my collection, so... That look mm-hmm. good displayed there. I've got, I've got, yeah. As I said, when we have done the giveaway, I've got the four or five sets of the Jurassic Park cards <laughs> overflowing. So it's just good to finally get the Lost World ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, um, I have that Hunger for Humans one kind of blown up. That I mean, I don't know where I found. I can't remember. I think I found it on eBay a scan of the Hunger for Humans card. Yeah. And it's I just got it really big blown up on um, in my. Just a park uh, image collection. Well, it sort of it has that male Tyrannosaur on it in that um, in the in its colours and sort of a lot of that sort of artwork around the time had sort of that his right leg up um, as, as if he was walking, um, mm-hmm. just sort of like the Thrasher because the Thrasher done that too, didn't it? Didn't have it one leg more forward yeah. than the other. No, no, no the Thrasher has both legs kind of. Um, just standing there static. It's a very neutrally, neutrally plo, uh, posed toy. Oh, yeah. I suppose, like we were talking with that Ultimate Colossal one the other day, you sort of want it to be able to stand with its big head and, and being able to eat people as well. Mm-hmm. CQ, CQ, this is Engine Operations Harvest Leader to Harvest Base. Repeating, I'm calling for Engine Operations Harvest Leader seeking Engine Harvest Base. Go ahead, Harvest Leader. Yeah. All right, anything else you want to uh, discuss before we get end out the week with 88? Yeah, I also bought a Jurassic Park uh, item today. In fact, um, at work they had a Jurassic Park t-shirt. It's kind of like this odd... Uh, it's like a tie-dye kind of. It's gray with the logo kind of tie-dye colored. Okay, yep. So, yeah, that was just a little, nice little score I got today. I'm trying to liven up my... Uh, wardrobe get away from the black t-shirt you know <laughs> yeah like half, more than half of my wardrobe right now is just black t-shirts <laughs> yeah that's one rabbit hole i haven't gone down yet um is the <laughs> sort of the clothing i've got a i've got a jurassic park t-shirt and i um got a jurassic world one sort of done up with the facebook group i admin but um i've got several safe searches on ebay of sort of like uh ingen singlets and stuff like that um not really uniforms or cosplay or anything like that, but just, mm-hmm. um, just I well, since the uh, since Larry had the the old Jurassic Park T-shirt on in Jurassic World, like that's that's getting reproduced reproduced everywhere as well. So that distressed look logo, and I'd just love to get the same for the Lost World as well. But there's a lot out there. <laughs> mm-hmm. Leave it to you, Ian, to have associations, affiliations, even liaisons. With the best people in so many fields. You didn't contact Sarah. Paleontological behavior study is a brand new field, and Sarah Harding is on that frontier. No. Yeah, the operation has suffered severe casualties, and the survivors are now in mortal danger. I need you to send rescue immediately. All right, ready to get into 88? Yeah, sure. As we ended on Minute 87 of Lost World, Nick had found the communication center and was quickly searching it, and the beam of his torch had found the power junction box. As we open on minute 88, his torch beam then finds a large, flat Westinghouse switch. 
and he moves over to turn it on. At 87 minutes and 9 seconds as he flips the switch on, a light globe near his head illuminates, then sparks and blows. The whole room's lit up by a dull orange light, along with computer consoles, radio equipment. A squawk from the radio gets Nick's attention, and he moves over to the equipment and starts pushing vines aside, searching for the radio. At 87 minutes and 20 seconds, he finds the radio and starts turning the dial, looking for the right frequency. At 87 minutes and 27 seconds, he grabs the microphone and starts setting out his broadcast. At 87 minutes and 37 seconds, he gets to respond and stands, telling the person on the radio that the operation suffered severe casualties and the survivors are now in mortal danger, and he needs them to send rescue immediately. At 87 minutes and 52 seconds, we cut away from Nick in the operations building to Peter Ludlow, back in the creek bed near the ruined Indian camp. He's slowly walking forward, an amazed look on his face, as in the background we can hear a large animal breathing slowly. And this ends minute 88 of The Lost World. As we've seen in 87, Nick sort of finds the power box and uh, covered in moss, and um, as the camera pans down we see that Westinghouse electric power switch. Yeah, which is kind of funny because Westinghouse in a way kind of suffered the same fate as Injun in that <laughs> they had a financial disaster in 1990. Yeah. In which it was probably in, in universe it was probably too late for Hammond to go back because I'm sure he set up all their infrastructure on Isla Sorna with Westinghouse. But yeah, all it. Um, Westinghouse ended up going bankrupt and being bought by CBS and and, and being dissolved with it. <laughs> and no way, uh, I'm sorry, Toshiba it was sold to. Yeah. In 2007. Hmm. And in 19, and it was kind of just just divvied up and destroyed. I wonder if this is probably one of those things like we're talking um, with the uh, with the monitors uh, in the reception area where. This is more a sign of 97 and not a sign of 93. I assume Westinghouse would have been quite quite wide spanned in 93 as well, but um, obviously they've built this set here and they've used the used the Westinghouse switch for the power panel. I just wish it had that red glow, just to call back to the novel, mm-hmm. just so you can sort of see that red glow beside the the switch before he switched it on, but. He puts a torch up on top of uh, some radio equi- or some equipment mm-hmm. beside it and uh, lifts that switch. And I just love switch. how there's a there's a sort of a low hanging light globe light globe beside his head that uh, sparks yeah. out <laughs> as the room lights come on. Yeah, it's kind of funny. It just the light bulb hasn't been lit in so long. It just can't handle electricity going through it. You know mm. that white that filament inside is just too old. To take like take the electricity anymore. Yeah, even the light socket because it sparks a bit once the light goes out. Yeah. But um, the room, the whole room lights up, and we hear a squawk from the radio, which gets his attention. Um, mhm. And we, and now that the lights are on, we can we get a good shot of the uh, ra- all the radio equipment there. Looks like he um, I'm not, sh- I'm not, what is that? Like that he put his flashlight. It almost looks like a um. It, yeah, I think it is. I think it looks like a um, old one of those water tank coolers, water like water coolers, you know, you know with the, like the five gallon tub. What's that? Uh, the the flashlight's on. Yeah, it looks like you remember those um five gallon tubs. You uh, they stuck the thing in, and then you put the little paper cup at the bottom, and it filled it up with either warm or cold water. I'll just send you a quick photo here of one screen grab I've got. It looks like a um a uh. A server box. A what? Like a server box, like um, like in computer rooms here you got like all the servers. Oh yeah, I uh, no, I mean, but it has like that an indentation inside of it, you know. Oh yeah, but but it's, it's high, like, he... like it's it's up to his oh, nearly to his shoulders. Actually, what it looks yeah, like. I mean, he's right down so. Yeah, you can see that there's a latch there halfway up the side of it. I reckon that's like a um. Equipment container that's sitting on its end, because it looks like um, handles down at the very bottom of the shot. Hmm. But because I mean, looking at it from my point of view, it it, it definitely looks like it's got like an indentation inside of it hmm. that you would you could reach your hand in and you know. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and as he sort of goes along and pulls some of the vines off, I love this <laughs> this free computer monitors here that are all yeah. instantly on. There's no booting up, nothing required. They're just on. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, it looks like that they have some kind of login screen or something like that. Yeah. In in green lettering, and then the other one looks like it's got like a blue screen on the on on there. Yeah. And again, I'll just, <laughs> I'd love for some be able to get some ultra high D stuff here too because the image I'm looking at, that um that table we're talking about in the last minute's got a bright yellow light that's sort of come on underneath that glass panel, mm-hmm. but we only see we only see the side of the grid box. <laughs> we don't see the map itself, unfortunately. Yeah. But um, he sort of keeps on searching there, and uh, mm-hmm. all of a sudden we get a cut to the radio, and he kneels down and mm-hmm. um starts searching for the frequency. He's got the the paper there, he's not even looking at the book, which <laughs> they uh, they said earlier yeah. that the frequencies are in that book, so he's sort of just reading off that, that piece of paper or that um, that map mm-hmm. in the plastic folder. And you can hear the uh, the old standard radio squawking and the sort of... I'm not even going to try and do yeah, the noise it's... of as you're searching between frequencies. Um, it's a ham radio, isn't it, of some sort? Yeah, I... I've looked at, I've tried to lighten up the scene here and even back in the um, the reception area before. You don't, you, like, there's no telephones um, here, even though later in Jurassic Park 3, yes, we see telephones in the administration building, but if this is their only source of communication <laughs> in and out, like a shortwave radio... No, ham radios are very long wave. Yeah, yeah, well, I've never, never really looked at a ham radio, so I don't... I don't know. Yeah, ham radio. I, I, my dad had a ham radio, and we used to, um, like we'd be able to contact truckers on it all the way on on the, that was on the highway, and we'd be able to just get into their, uh, like, or not like hack into it, but um, we'd just be able to uh, cut into their radio that they had in their car, yeah, or the, in their truck, and <laughs> be able to talk to them. Yeah, become a nuisance. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I suppose. Some, some of the ham radio. <laughs> I suppose too, going back to contact the movie where they're in that sort of at the start. Yeah. Calling calling people down in Florida from up in the higher states. So. Mhm. Again, sort of, you wonder if okay if that big tower behind the operations building is the antenna for it. But I love how he sort of just he turns the dial left a bit, then right a bit, and says, "Yep, they got it," and sort of starts talking where you can see the um, the signal strength bar, but there's no digital or analog display to actually show what frequency you're searching for. He's sort of just going off the ear, wait, <laughs> ear off his ear. Mm-hmm. I think the glass is fogged up because you see kind of a molted-looking glass-like fog fog thing right, or right next to the um, gauge there yeah. that's lit up. Yeah. So I think I... I think he's just look at kind of um, going to the frequency that he's told to and hoping that there's somebody there. Mm. Yeah, because then he says right there, right there, and sort of sits the map booklet down on the table and uh, grabs a very old-looking microphone. Um, mm-hmm. Which, again, I'd have to go back to Jurassic Park and see if that's similar to what... Well, Hammond's using one on a stick um, when he's talking to the explorers, but I wonder if there's more, because we see... No, because um, Arnold's got a headset, so... Yeah. I wonder if that's time, like, sort of uh, a 90 for early 90s version of a microphone mm-hmm. as well. Well, in uh, the movie, in the movie, uh, uh, Jurassic Park, John Hammond has a headset as well, and you can see it on his head. Oh, okay. And he just presses a button on, I think he's got on there, and he's able to go onto an intercom that's in the cars. Mm-hmm. And then he sends the radio call. CQ, CQ, this is Engine mm-hmm. Operations Harvest Leader to Harvest Space. Repeating, I'm calling for Engine Operations Harvest Leader, seeking Engine Harvest Space. Now, again, because if this is a ham radio or a powerful radio, then it can probably broadcast to the mainland. Mm-hmm. In the script that we'll get to later, when uh, after the Trenosaur comes down, there's a shot of them looking from a ridge out across the ocean. There's a... There's a cargo ship just offshore that um, was their camp, but this this tells me there's another camp on Sauna, whether it's at the harbour or... 
Because it's the Operation the Harvest Leader, which would have been Ludlow, calling for Harvest Base. I don't think they'd have a Harvest Base back on the mainland. Mm, I don't know. I mean, it's a good question because um, in the concept art, we do see that there was a large, um, like a large container ship docked at the um, docked on Isla Sorna that the helicopter flies over. Mm. Yeah, and it's but, sort of gonna it's gonna come back again too in a couple of minutes' time where we get back to the Trenosaur where it's being prepared for yeah. moving off mm-hmm. island. It's just there's a couple of Hueys there that are only really short range aircraft, so mm-hmm. um, exactly, and they airlift the the T Rex and stick it on the boat, mm. which we presume, which I presume was Isla was or not Isla it was um, ESS Venture. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it just sort of raises that question. Yes, okay, you had to get to the operations building. And again, it sort of comes up again when we cut from here, we cut back in a minute, we'll cut to the Tyrannosaur on the ground, then we go back to Ian and crew coming in. They only spend about five minutes in that village and the helicopter arrives. So it wasn't coming yeah. from very far away either. No, it wasn't. That's, that's another good point. Um, Again, this this could all be just an issue with them changing the end of the film and not uh, because it's not it's not explained in either of the uh, other scripts either, apart from the fact that there's just a boat offshore, all the cargo vessels offshore, and that's where their uh, base is. So, mm-hmm. um, sadly, it's not really something we're going to uh, get an answer to. But um, he gets a yeah. response: "Go ahead, Harvest Leader." Nick stands up and grabs the map book again off the table and says, yeah, the operation has, severe, has suffered severe casualties and the survivors are now in mortal danger. I need you to send rescue immediately. Our coordinates here are, um, <laughs> our coordinates here are 9 degrees, 58 minutes north, 85 degrees, and then we cut. Which I think they were on the uh, the original Lost Dash World website with the map in Hammond's office. Because mm-hmm. you had uh, the Boneyard, the Worker Village, or the operations building, the labs and that and all those um, all those coordinates they had on the photos they actually went to a spot off the coast of Costa Rica they just sort of put a pinprick out in the ocean somewhere and said Rodeo we'll just make it here (laughs) (laughs) Um, but um, yeah we don't we just sort of he says we need help and uh, and that's where we leave Nick in the operations building (laughs) Um, it's probably going to be a couple of minutes before we see him again but uh we cut back to the ruined engine camp and uh, Ludlow's slowly walking towards the camera, a stunned look on his face. Obviously looking at something amazing, you can hear the heavy breathing of a large animal too there, which yeah. um, seems a bit heavier and resonates a lot more than it probably should um, because of maybe the fact that Roland hit it with two darts and it's sort of going into a coma. But um, mm-hmm. I... <laughs> I've got no idea. I always thought there was half a boat stuck in the rocks behind him. Yeah, I'm going to admit, I thought the same. I, I still I don't too. know if that's just some can like a hammock or something. I just I, I think that's the remains of the uh, tent. Okay. It just seemed too rigid, like, as I said again, like a boat or a canoe, half a canoe sitting there. <laughs> um, well, it was one of those tents that you put up a frame and then put the tent over it. Oh, okay, know? yep, yep. So I think that's just the frame that was with the bit of canvas draped over it. Yeah, I'll get a um, I'll get a high def image of that and post up in the Facebook group too, and we can discuss <laughs> during the week. Yeah. How much it doesn't look like a boat when you actually properly look at it <laughs> in a still, but <laughs> um, but uh, that's all I've got for eighty eight. Another week done. Anything else on that you want to talk about, Dave? No, I think we covered it pretty much pretty well. All right. Um, just a heads up for next week uh, I'm heading off into the wasteland this next weekend so I'll be gone for four days so there might be a uh, we might skip a week here just uh, for everyone's information alright but apart from that that's us done for the day alright guys let's get the hell out of here contact details are on the website thelostworldminute.com you can email feedback to thelostworldminute at gmail.com facebook thelostworldminute twitter at thelostworldminute Instagram, The Lost World Minute. Easy to remember. Yeah, yeah, very easy to remember. (laughs) Uh, David, thank you for joining me for this recording. You're welcome. And uh, we'll be back. I've been Brad. I'm Dave. And uh, we'll talk to you all later. Talk to you later. Bye.
It is absolutely imperative that we work with the Costa Rican Department of Biological Preserves to establish a set of rules for the preservation and isolation of that island. These creatures require our absence to survive, not our help. And if we could only step aside and trust in nature, life will find a way. Dr. Malcolm, I had to share a few campfire stories with my uncle. Are you going on a camping trip? Yeah, yeah, I'm going out to Broken Hill where they filmed the second Mad Max movie. Oh, it sounds like cool. Or it sounds fun. Going out to yeah, going out to visit a lot of the film locations out there. So I get my uh, my drone comes back on Monday or Tuesday, so I'll have that to take some aerial footage. And yeah, can't wait to get out there and just sort of burn up the highway a little bit <laughs> <laughs> um, out in the outback. So yeah, yeah well, it's sort of weird because you got the two on the wall behind over on the far side as well. Mm-hmm. Where I they call them the blinking light machines, where it's just a tower of um, blinking lights that's sort of yeah. meant to meant to show off some sort of computer equipment, but mm-hmm. um, it just looks like one of those sort of rigid, like the concerts and that sort of stuff have those hard cases um, where your sort of lid just comes over and latches on. You got the um, the handles on the side, so mm-hmm. that might be just a, a temporary thing they put in and never never put in a proper radio or something and that's why the ham radio is there but mm-hmm. or maybe they took it with yeah which makes me wonder if that's if they communicated to nublar like that if if there was some sort of radio to receive on nublar because over there it's all telephone yeah. which would have to be which have to be radio phone to uh to get a signal off the island even though it's modems and the early internet <laughs> you'd imagine for a modem phone there but because yeah, the two islands would have to talk to each other, but yeah. anyway, that's speculation. Yeah.